Hello. Our story begins inside the industrial complex on Coruscant. Dooku arrived from the Jedi Temple to meet with his master for the first time since officially leaving the Jedi Order. Qui-Gon Jinn was dead, the last reason to stay within the Jedi. He would have done anything within his power to make sure his former students survived. For a Jedi, the bond between master and apprentice was incomparable. Dooku walked out of his Jedi vessel and met with his master. They began their conversation, with Dooku speaking about how cities had gone too far. Cities was so easy on the topic. It was the price of the future they desired. Maul would have made a great long-time apprentice. A ceiling like his was very high, but he failed to a Padawan. If Qui-Gon and Maul were not adequate enough to live, then their place in the future was never secure. Palpatine was very adamant that Dooku chose this path, and there would be more sacrifices, despite both of them losing apprentices on the same day. Sidious turned and started walking into the facility further, speaking of how the galaxy would not be remade without sacrifice. Master Windu followed Dooku here, and he heard everything so far. He snuck into the facility and put himself behind a vessel. He knew that he needed to hear everything he could. With Master Qui-Gon dead and Maul dead too, the council needed to know which was killed, the Master or the Apprentice. But by the looks of things, Obi-Wan killed the Apprentice because this was a Master, a Dark Lord of the Sith, orchestrating things and now having seemingly pulled his longtime friend Dooku to the dark side. Maze kept quiet and listened further as the two individuals continued their talks. Dooku questioned if the Dark Lord didn't trust him or his loyalty. Palpatine was always in question. One could not orchestrate the fall of the Jedi and the Republic without having reservations about those closest to him. Dooku may have done everything he was asked to do, but how much more would be asked of him? Sidious was intent on making sure everything he did was for the greater good of their cause. Dooku then spouted off a few things he had done thus far. Sifo Dyas, Kamino, the clones. How many would die for his actions? Windu couldn't believe what he was hearing. Was his friend behind the death of Qui-Gon and Sifo Dyas? What was on Kamino and what about these clones? Windu listened further and Sidious expressed that this was the price of freedom. The Jedi Master could feel his friend slipping into darkness as he stepped out from behind his vessel and demanded that Dooku stop what he was doing. This had gone far enough. Dooku and Sidious turned back and the Sith Lord muttered under his breath that Dooku had betrayed him. The former Jedi quickly denied the accusation before stepping forward and confronting Windu. Mace was adamant that this could all be resolved, calling for Dooku to turn his back on the darkness. The former Jedi asked if he knew, and Mace told his former friend that that didn't matter now. What mattered was what they did right here and right now. Sidious expressed adamantly to not believe the Jedi Master, reminding him that they served a corrupt Senate, they were beyond saving, and Dooku would have to forgo his attachments to his friends. Mace was expressive that despite his role in the Council, he would help him resolve this issue. They didn't need to worry about the consequences. If they stopped the Sith together, Dooku broke out, saying the word, enough. Windu stopped and looked at Dooku. His friend looked so lost. Mace reached out his hand and told him to come with him. Sidious from behind told Dooku that if he wanted to prove his loyalty, he needed to kill Windu. Mace believed they could still make this right and Dooku expressed that he was afraid. Windu was preparing to bring his friend back home and then Dooku said he was afraid it was too late. Dooku's lightsaber ignited and Mace looked to the Sith Lord. Only so many features were available on the Sith Lord's face. A chin, a nose, and the piercing yellow eyes, surrounded by darkness. Mace looked back to Dooku and ignited his Jedi weapon. He told Dooku that it didn't need to come to this, and before he could finish his sentence, his small friend darted across the chambers. When Dooku backpedaled, blocking the strike, the two longtime allies were close. They sparred often enough, and they were quickly thrusted into this engagement. The one that would determine the life and death of the Jedi. The balance of everything stood on this moment. Mace blocked and shifted, avoiding every strike from the overly aggressive Dooku. What made matters worse for Mace was the fact that Dooku wasn't using the dark side. He was still in the light, allowing it to control all of his movements. He pressed the initiative. Without a darkness to draw from, Windu had to win this in a straight fight, which would be incredibly difficult against Dooku. The only Jedi to ever have beaten Dooku was his master, and that was Yoda, not Mace Windu. The Jedi and the new Sith Apprentice toiled back and forth in the hangar bay, before they split off. Windu didn't change his stance, he was completely involved here. Dooku pressed his assault again. Mace was in a bind. He had to defend himself from one of the most proficient duelists of this generation, while making sure the Sith Lord didn't try and make a move against him. But Sidious wouldn't do that. He wanted Dooku to prove his loyalty. Killing Mace, for him, wouldn't do him any good. The Jedi and the Sith pushed and pulled. Dooku trying for the first time to dig into his anger. It did give Mace a little to latch onto, but before he could take advantage of it, they broke off. 
when you gave Dooku one final chance to end this madness and return to the Jedi. Without breaking, the former Jedi told Windu that he would never return to the light. Their duel continued once more. It was incredibly even matched, each of them toiling for control over the battlefield. Dooku stole the advantage though, shoving Windu backwards and watching the Jedi Master look to his escape vessel. Dooku gritted his teeth, suggesting that Windu was running back to his council. The Jedi Master shook his head, expressing that the light would always prevail. Even if he believed differently, his betrayal of self would cost him much more than even he knew. Dooku got angry, lunging forward, just for Mesa to step out of the way, parrying the few strikes he could before reaching outwards and pulling the engine apart inside the Jedi shuttle. He knew his way around the engine, so making a little show of this would be exhilarating for the Sith. Dooku didn't even get the idea of what Mace was doing, because he moved out of the way so quickly, and then the engine on Dooku's Jedi shuttle exploded next to Sidious, launching him backwards. Dooku looked over in shock, and Mace pressed forward, catching Dooku by surprise as he lobbed his blade up to defend himself. Mace got a lucky hit, before avoiding Dooku's rage. The strike was one on the side of Dooku's cheek, cutting through his face, and then Mace pulled back. The new Sith Apprentice was enraged as he pressed forward as Sidious rose from the flames. Windu knew that this fight was over. Even if he beat Dooku, the chances of him being able to stop the Sith plan were unlikely. He didn't doubt himself, but he didn't want the Jedi Order to fail, because he could not report on the knowledge he acquired here. Maze leapt backwards onto the door hinge for the hangar. He told his former friend that he was sorry for him. He would never have the adoration he once had as a Jedi. All he would know was misery and betrayal. The day would come when Sidious would throw his name into the fires, just like Maul. There would be a day when all of his accomplishments would amount to nothing, and the Sith would fall. With Dooku being used as the Dark Lord's scapegoat, May stepped back as Dooku rushed him. May flipped the lever on the door with a force, and the door slammed shut in front of Dooku. Dooku thrusted his blade into the door, but it was so thick, Windu couldn't even tell. He quickly returned to his vessel and left for the temple. Coruscant felt eerier than ever before. Mace couldn't believe what happened here. He returned to the council chambers and quickly informed them all of what had just happened. While he didn't know it yet, Yaddle had just stepped down from his seat on the high council. She did it later than she planned on doing so, which is why she never caught Dooku in the act. But she did inform Windu that his friend was acting a little suspicious, which is why Windu ended up following Dooku to the industrial complex. When Mace entered the council chambers, everyone was shocked with his urgency. He always held such composure, but he was adamant that he found the hideout for the Sith and they needed to go. The council all looked to each other, before each of them one by one stood to their feet and moved with them. He would explain everything on the way to the industrial complex. By the time they arrived, it was empty. Dooku and Sidious had vacated, but there were remnants of the Jedi vessel that Windu used to blow up. The fresh burns and the still hot ashes made it clear to the Jedi that Windu wasn't lying. Of course he wouldn't ever lie to this degree, but it was an extra incentive to know that he wasn't losing his mind, though the building was burning down. It was a fire lit elsewhere in the facilities. So, the Jedi Council kept their eyes peeled, but they never found anything before the building burnt up, which led them back to the High Council chambers to discuss what Windu heard about. He told them that Dooku had some involvement with Kamino, clones, and the recent disappearance of Master Sifo Dyas. Windu suggested that Master Jocasta was currently siphoning through the information in the archives to try and figure out what she knew of Kamino. With it having been removed from the archives, she wouldn't be able to deliver anything to him. The council was in an uproar. None of it made any sense. Why would Dooku betray the Jedi Order? Even more than that, try and kill one of his best friends. Mace was honestly hurt by it, but he was a council member. His mandate was to the Jedi Order. It meant he had to put all of his personal feelings aside so that he could do what was best for the Order. He could not play favorites, and he understood that. Taking the role of Master of the Order meant that he had to be ready as possible, though he could tell that Yoda wasn't ready. How could Yoda's final student become a student of the Sith, betray the Jedi, and even be okay with killing his friend, or at the very least forcing him to disappear? The Council uproar lasted for hours. The debates didn't stall and they continued. When Master Jocasta informed them that she couldn't find anything about the planet Kamino, Mace understood that it meant that Dooku removed it from the archives. Deleting that kind of information led him to believing they needed to find the planet and figure out what was going on out there. Master Yuda was quiet during the entire debate, which was saying something in comparison to other Jedi in the High Council that were typically quieter. May suggested that he would begin looking for this Kamino. At the same time, he would drop a sketch that the Jedi could run through the database, a sketch of Darth Sidious. There were some prominent features, so perhaps the Jedi could run the features through a database and see if they could find him. He had an identifiable chin and nose, which was better than nothing. Who knew what would come from it? Mace also made a point to suggest that the Sith were in on this. He didn't know to what extent, but they were a part of it in some way, shape, or form. 
across the city, Sidious and Dooku set up inside a new facility. Palpatine had a multitude of these, just in case something happened. It was outfitted with everything the other one had. There was a Sith altar and artifacts and anything he could get his hands on to cultivate the darkness. Sidious considered blaming Dooku, but the truth is, he wasn't behind it. Though this didn't mean that Dooku would get some instantaneous pass. He knew how to be extra vigilant. Sidious couldn't just vanish from the public eye to go on a vacation to clean up this mess. He had to put faith in the Dooku, so that he could fix this little problem. There was also another issue, Dooku couldn't be in the public eye now. The original plan of him becoming Count of Sereno and rounding up allies across the galaxy for a separatist plan wouldn't work. Instead, Sidious had another idea, one he formed in case something like this happened. He was either extremely lucky, or masterful unlike anyone else. Sidious told Dooku that instead of being the front of the movement, he would go to every world across the galaxy, whether it be in a system or singular planet, and fix this issue. Dooku asked his master for his bidding, and Sidious expressed that there were radicals and elitists out in the galaxy that could be easily bought. Dooku had the funds to do it with his family's estate on Sereno. He was to go to his homeworld and pull every last fund from the estate, put it into Damask Holdings, which Sidious had been using ever since killing his former teacher, and then use it. Dooku would then use these holdings to push out his wealth to buy these radicals. Dooku didn't quite understand. Of course he didn't, and Palpatine spelled it out for him. There were corrupt politicians all across the galaxy, though most of them never got a chance to use their voice. He smiled and told Dooku to give them a platform, allow them to be radical, allow them to garner an audience, to rile people up, to make people afraid or upset or fill them with hatred. Give them an enemy, and then allow these individuals with just enough of a voice to attain rules of power. Give them their platforms, do whatever it takes to make their quiet voice be heard. They existed. Their feeble minds would have them believing that their power was for them, when in reality it was for the Sith. All it took was making them believe they had a voice, and then when the time was right, because the Sith gave them all their power, Dooku would be able to use it to rise to the top of their ranks just in time for the Clone Wars. On the other side of this coin, while the Sith were working on this plan, the Jedi would be heading to Kamino the second they could. Dooku was informed to go to the Kaminoans and force them to not trust anyone. If a single one of them broke, they would all be killed. Dooku was to paint the image as clearly as possible. If the Kaminoans informed the Jedi of anything going on inside their facilities, then they would lose their army. Dooku asked his master how the Jedi would accept an army from the cloners that openly lied to them. Said he's turned to his student with a devious grin and told him to figure it out. The Dark Lord turned and walked to his altar as Dooku was left with shame. Could he really do this? There was conflict within him. Having not killed a Jedi Master left him with curiosity if he could actually kill a Jedi Master, one that was a friend. If he could beat Windu, would he have been able to kill him? He didn't know, and this lack of knowledge filled him with confusion on if he could or could not kill a Jedi. It ate him alive from the inside out. But if he was a Sith, he needed to fulfill his master's orders. So that's what he did. His first stop was Kamino, and he requested that Jango Fett meet him there. Across Coruscant, the Jedi were beginning their investigation. Hundreds of masters were involved in this. They were told that if they came into contact with Master Dooku, that they were to not engage. He was far too powerful for any ordinary Jedi, and so it was their duty to avoid him. If they found him, report on his dealings and his location. Due to High Republic laws within the Jedi Order, each Jedi Master was to be accompanied by another Master. The only reason for such urgency from the Council was because one of their own saw it happening. If Sidious could convince Dooku to join his ranks, then what would prevent more Jedi from joining the Sith? What would prevent the rise of a powerful regime, one that the Sith were obviously trying to create? Mesa abandoned the temple for some contacts within the city. He met with them and after several days he was able to get the information he required leading him to the coordinates for Kamino. He was currently traveling with Jedi Master Depa Balava, his former apprentice. They arrived outside the Kamino system and looked to each other. Windu pulled the vessel down onto the landing platforms of Topoka City. The two Jedi walked out of the vessel and down the ramp. The rain was pouring down on them, as their hoods were raised simultaneously and they started walking towards the entrance to the facilities. Mace was grateful they were able to find the connection so fast, though it came from Jedi elsewhere in the galaxy. Whatever. They walked into the city and they were approached by a tall woman, welcoming them. She expressed that if the Jedi wanted to meet with the Prime Minister, he was currently off-world. Windu and Depa turned to each other and shook their heads. They didn't want to meet with anyone or need to. They just wanted to know something about this facility. Perhaps the Jedi could place an order with the Kaminoans for some clones. She popped right up and smiled, 
welcoming them further into the facilities. She expressed that they would find that their cloning was the best in the galaxy. Mace and Deppa acted as if they were exhilarated to hear so. They continued and suggested that one of their allies was here, and they wanted to know if they could add to that order. The truth is, the Jedi had no clue. They were playing sabacc with the Kaminoan woman, hoping that she would know something, and truthfully, she did. It was easy to break through to a Kaminoan. All one had to do is express that they had money, and that they were also willing to pay handsomely. Being that a Jedi already put in an order for a clone army for the Republic, perhaps the Jedi were unaware of what Dooku had mentioned. Khan We guided the Jedi along the corridors, expressing that all their advancements and what they could do, and what the Jedi could expect from their purchase. Windu told Tan Wee that their friend, turning to Depa Balaba and scratching his head, saying that he couldn't remember the name of that Jedi. Tan Wee shot up smiling that it was her friend Sifo Dias. May smiled and pointed to her, admitting that that was the name. He continued to suggest that Master Sifo Dias used the wrong donor for the project. Tan Wee asked what was wrong with Jango Fat. Windu lowered his voice to a whisper, to sound as ominous as possible, and told her that Jango Fett was a lethal bounty hunter, and rumor had it that he was trying to be the donor for these clones so that he could take over an entire star system for himself. His plan was to use the Jedi for their credits and use the clones for evil. Obviously the Kaminoans didn't care what happened with the clones once they were paid for, but the Tan Wee, this sounded awful. She told the two Jedi that Jango was here inside the facilities right now, if they wanted to find him and meet him. Windu told her that if they could, it would be very nice, but they would be here to likely capture him and take him back to the temple to interrogate. Mace looked to his former student and asked that she get some restraints. Tan Wee was very nervous, but Windu was very assuring that there wouldn't be any issues. Once Deppa got back, they continued along together, prying at Tan Wee to get any other information. They couldn't get anything aside from the fact that Jango was the sample being used for the clone army. They also couldn't figure out anything relating to the disappearance of Master Sifo Dias. Deppa expressed that her friend had been missing ever since he met with Django, and expressed that if there was anyone else here, they could be plotting against the Kaminoans or worse. Tan Wee would like to help, but the only other individual with that sort of information were the chief medical scientist and the prime minister, and she would have said something if she could, but she was also unaware. After all, it was Lord Tyrannus who was involved with the whole operation, but Tan Wee did not know. Once they entered Django's room, it was quiet. The Jedi did a quick interrogation, and once Jango started showing signs of hostility, the Jedi pried a little further. Jango informed the Jedi that he was hired by a man named Tyrannus. Neither of them recognized the name, and Deppa asked Jango if he knew what he looked like. Jango shrugged his shoulders and said he could point him out. Windu had a hollow image of him and Dooku before the mission to Raxus Secundus. He showed the image to Jango, and there was a slight movement in Jango's eyes, but he doubled down, saying that he didn't recognize the man. Both Deppa and Mace caught the moment and told Jango that they would like permission to look around, and he denied. Without his armor, he wouldn't be much of a challenge, despite being Mandalorian. When he tried to challenge the Jedi, it was very quickly resolved. He was put into his place when he tried to put Windu into a headlock, He used his hands to put him down. Mace used Jango like a speed bag, and the rest was history. They locked Jango up and sedated him. Mace and Deppa put him into the corner of the room and asked Han Wee for a cart. They would like to move all of his stuff back to the Jedi Temple. Deppa also informed Tan Wee that the Jedi would be effectively removing their order from Kamino. It was clear that their facilities couldn't be trusted at the moment. Tan Wee was disappointed, but she was informed to keep this quiet until they left. There was no reason to alert the Prime Minister, who was clearly not on world. Tan Wee was becoming frustrated, but there was nothing, and I mean nothing, she could do. The Jedi quickly got all their information, the Mandalorian armor, data records, and anything they could find, and returned to their shuttle. The trip through hyperspace had Master and Apprentice pulling all the information they had. Jango hated the Jedi, but he wouldn't wake up until he was within the halls of their temple. There'd be no escaping. The Jedi housed everything they needed, and no one, aside from potentially Dooku, could know he was trapped and guarded extensively. The information they had led Windu and Deppa to the planet of Hupadia, the homeworld of the Pike Syndicate. Initially, this seemed like such an odd place to go, but when they landed, they were met with passive aggressiveness. The Pikes had no interest in welcoming the Jedi, but they also couldn't say no. Mace and Deppa bought their way into their facility so they could have a discussion with a prisoner they didn't know was missing. His name was Silman, but it was revealed by the Pike leader that the man named Tyrannus paid them handsomely to keep Silman imprisoned, having only been in prison for around a year. Silman hadn't lost his mind, but he was struggling. He was malnourished and left in the dark, having lost all concept of time. Thanks to the Jedi payment, he was given his freedom and the Jedi learned of what happened. 
Cyphodius was shot down by the pikes over Felucia. Silman was a survivor, and he was taken to Obadiah by the pikes to be their prisoner. Tyrannus wanted no loose ends, but when you deal with criminals, you better have more money than whoever wanted to get to the bottom of the case. The Jedi had more money. Mace was the one who got to the bottom of Tyrannus' case and who he was. Because while the Jedi were making their progress, learning about this man named Tyrannus, who very quickly was deciphered to be Dooku, the Sith were making their moves in the Mid-Rim. Dooku and Sidious didn't know how close the Jedi were to uncovering their plot. They had little connection or conversation with Jango to begin with. The only thing that was going for them was their connection to Tyrannus, but the Kaminoans didn't care anymore. The Jedi made it clear that whoever was going to pay them was lying. This turned them off from business with Tyrannus and the Jedi. They almost spent billions of credits creating a clone army, one that would never be paid back. They didn't reach out to Dooku to inform him, because they almost lost out on all those credits. They had a huge bank, but putting up that kind of money to not get paid back was deceitful and evil. The Kaminoans had everything in order too. They had the shipments for what would eventually become their phase 1 clone armor. They also had all their sizes down, and how many clones would be in the first batch? 200,000 units to be exact. All the science had been finished by Nalase, and they were preparing to move forward with their plans. But now, there would be no Grand Army of the Republic. If the Jedi or the Republic or Tyrannus would not be paying them, there would be no army. Dooku was making all sorts of progress in the Mid-Rim. He was pushing forward the incentive to bring to the front of the political races more radical minds. Initially, the plan felt like it wouldn't go anywhere, but thanks to Dooku's funds, which had not been liquidated on Sereno, he was able to support each of these movements. They started out small, and they progressively grew. Dooku's initial start, before the Jedi ever found Kamino, was small local elections, to make sure he got the formula down. The irony of doing this is he was promoting the inverse of what it was he was already against. The Republic was corrupt, and he was pushing even more loony and corrupt individuals into places of power. It started with mayors, governors, chancellors, and presidents of planets. By the time the Jedi found Kamino and captured Django, he had moved on to representative races and senate races. It wasn't easy, but money talked. Dooku went under a different alias called Devesto Dryjor. With a fake name, no one could identify him with the Jedi, and as he began his descent into darkness, his beard started to lose his color. Dooku was 70 years old when he joined the Sith, and he looked spry as ever, and with the darkness taking over, his body began to reflect it, wrinkles becoming more pronounced, and the age of his life becoming more visible than ever before. Devesto Trajor avoided contact with the Jedi, who did become more visible, but because they weren't paying attention to local elections, they weren't noticing the total maniacs that were propping up in the political positions of power. Dooku's alias may have not been his name, but people started to recognize his face. He was a calling card for winning elections and supporting dreams, or better put, delusions. Dooku's production elicited reactions from more corrupt politicians trying to keep their power. His name was called upon consistently, and at a certain point, he stopped showing up because he was needed everywhere at once. His results were proven spectacular in the first month since this started. Most of the election cycles matched up with each other, which meant that Dooku was able to, in the span of a month, go into a world, prop up a conspiracy theorist or literal maniac, and gift them credits from companies such as the Techno Union, Commerce Guild, or Trade Federation, get them votes, and then put them into office. He did it simultaneously too. So many of these individuals rose to power at the same time. If he could control people on a planetary and even local level, nothing would stop his own rise to power on a galactic level. Palpatine began to see, for the first time, why he chose Dooku as his ally. His ability to cultivate the minds of others and give them a voice was remarkable. Good thing he was doing it for the Sith, because if he went in the other direction, he probably could have become the Chancellor. Sidious was fortunate enough to be an even larger master manipulator. Without Dooku's name being used, the Jedi couldn't lock onto them, and because they only paid attention to the Senate, they weren't noticing all the public officials in the Mid-Rim rising the power. All of these officials had some extremist quirk to them, and all of them would be heavily in favor of dismantling the Republic. The only issue was getting them to be patient, though because most of them were extremists already, it'd be hard to put them into a box and hope that they'd be quiet. Windu and Depa continued their search for the following months, but then something was brought to the Council's attention by Master Yaddle. She had been on the pursuit of Dooku as well, hoping that there was still good within him. When she figured out what he had been doing under a different alias, she couldn't believe it. Devesto Shrijor had done so much negativity in the galaxy. All these extremists were rallying cries for a push against the Republic. Palpatine seemed like he didn't know about it, and that obviously was an issue. But if these people continued to rise to power, then they could become an unstoppable movement. 
She also noted that all these people got credits from a single individual. The name wasn't familiar, but just like Tyrannus on Kamino, the face was associated with that of Count Dooku. The Jedi were in a bind, because despite them having the outline of Sidious's face, there was 100 quadrillion sentience in the galaxy. There were going to be people that just looked like each other, and there were a ton of species that could be crossed off the list, but it didn't make it any easier. So this was their first real lead since Kamino. Speaking of Kamino, Dooku hadn't been back, and because the Kaminoans and he kept very loose connections and updates, he didn't think anything of it. When Sidious sensed foul play, he sent Dooku to Kamino, and when he learned the truth, he murdered them all. It was also here when he found out that Jango had been captured by the Jedi. With the Jedi now on the trail of Dooku, Mace and Depa began looking into the political rings. The Jedi had to get involved, which forced several knights and masters out into the political arena to combat this rise of extremist powers. These individuals were calling for Palpatine's head, and they wanted to wage war. The first one of these uprisings happened on Iridu, and Captain Tarkin of the Republic military was the one to shut it down. His icy cold behavior led to more uprisings. All of a sudden, the grand plan started to crumble, because Dooku's protection of extremists made them believe they were unstoppable. But the Republic, without Palpatine, reacted heavily. Local militaries turned on their leaders and thrusted them from power. With Dooku doing damage control, Master Pong Krell was able to inform Mace Windu and Depa Balaba where Dooku was. The location was on Onderon, and the two Jedi tracked down Mr. Devaster Trajor. He was inside of a secret meeting with a couple wannabe senators and representatives. Onderon was the best place to do this type of business. Devesto Trajor informed them that he was being trailed, and he needed them to start trusting, protecting, and propping each other up. He couldn't fully support them by himself. If they could support each other, then he could remove suspicion from himself and get the Jedi off his back. Before the people could agree, the sound of a lightsaber ignition got their attention. They all turned back and looked at their purple lightsaber before the sound of another lightsaber turned them to a blue lightsaber in the other corner of the room. Windu told them all to stay put and they wouldn't be hurt. He spun his lightsaber around. No one could see who was in the room with them. They were both in the darkest corners of the room. Dooku stood up and ignited his crimson lightsaber and he told the Jedi to back off. But there would be none of that. Dooku grinned, cutting down the extremists around him. Windu felt so much shame, telling Dooku he had fallen so far so quickly. The new Sith told Mace that he wouldn't feel shame much longer. He would kill both of them. The duel began. Two brothers interlocked once again. Mace knew everything Dooku was responsible for. Depa joined in, and they fought the Sith apprentice. They were quick, but they also had to be careful. Dooku was fighting with the dark side, and Mace was able to lock onto it. He blocked and defended, but Mace could press his advantage. The dark side had not been kind to Dooku. Months into being a Sith, his face was covered in gray hairs and his body ached unlike ever before. The two thrusted and blocked, Depa got her strikes in as well. The only struggle for her is that she didn't have the same bond with Dooku, that her former master had at least. The former allies were interlocked, and with Depa's help and the use of Shatterpoint and Vapod, Windu shoved Dooku into the table before cutting him down. Mace felt so much shame when he did it. He didn't want to kill his friend. And when he felt the essence leave Dooku's body, he stepped back and dropped his blade. Mace looked down and felt shame and lifted his hands before his eyes. What had he done? His former student came up to him and told him that he was okay. It wasn't his fault. Dooku chose his path. He was capable of so much carnage and stopping him here would help the galaxy in ways they didn't know yet. Plus, Depa continued they could use his vessel to see if they could locate Sidious. Mace nodded his head, picking up his lightsaber and taking Dooku's blade. They called for a temple guard escort. They would take Dooku's body down to the temple, cleanse it, heal the crystal, and then bury them both. It took several minutes, but Depa and Mace would find all the information they needed to relay back to the temple. The location of Sidious's new lair was inside the center of the city, close to the opera house. It was in a high rise and it had a beautiful view. It was just filled with darkness. Apparently, it was pretty close to the Chancellor's mansion. The Jedi from the Council would quickly move. It was nighttime on Coruscant anyways, so they moved diligently, hoping the Sith Lord would be present. The current Council members on planet moved into the house quietly. Yoda led Kiari Mundi, Eeth Koth, Opa Rancisis, and Plo Koon into the building. They followed each other around and kept to each other's sides. They anticipated a great duel, but they weren't finding any signs of the Sith Lord. Maybe he wasn't home. The Jedi crept as quietly as possible without making any sounds. Despite wearing their boots and their capes dragging along the ground, they each were silent in their movements. Upper-class Coruscant residencies were silent due to their updated infrastructure. The Jedi, per the request of Yoda, were hiding their essences, just to make sure that the Sith wouldn't be alerted to their presence. As everything began to feel hopeless, as if they'd been sent the wrong way, 
Mundi's lightsaber ignited. The Jedi all rushed to the sound of the ignition, and they saw the Jedi Master standing over a bed. On the bed was the lifeless body of Chancellor Palpatine. Mundi turned to them with a grin and expressed that they found the Sith Lord. It was Palpatine. Yoda asked how that was possible and Mundi lifted Palpatine's sleeve, revealing a lightsaber. The ignition of the Crimson Blade was all the more proving. Despite not knowing it, the Jedi killed Sidious in the same way he killed his master, without him ever knowing how in danger he really was, slain in his sleep. The Jedi acted quickly, removing Palpatine's body and returning to the temple to do the same that was being done with Dooku's body. What remained now was the chaos that followed. But due to the investigation, the Jedi had to act. The Senate and the Republic were under the control of the Sith. It also meant that either Dooku was working against his master, or they had an extremist plan to divide the Republic, and once there was conflict, they could take control. The consensus belief was the latter, simply due to the attempt to create a clone army. In the following months, the Jedi would continue their investigation, finding out how truly deep the plot went, and what there was to uncover. While Palpatine didn't get the chance to tear down the Republic, it was clear what he was going to do. The Jedi didn't get involved in the cleanup for Palpatine, instead they cited that under Palpatine's rule, extremists were popping up in the mid-rim worlds, perhaps the Republic should change its focus. Though by this point it felt too late, the Republic itself wasn't beyond saving, all it needed was some good-hearted individuals. With Padme Amidala becoming senator in a few years, the change for good would be completed with a new generation of politicians. There would be a few extremists that got into power thanks to Divestor Dryjor, but with his disappearance and the lack of support, all the extremists did what they did before, screamed into a void, and became irrelevant. The Jedi had a lot of work to do and thanks to some of Yaddle's advice, she was able to be a healthier version of what Dooku should have been. Her conflict with the Council was through a means of debate and discussion. Mace was much more willing to see the negative impact of the Jedi, and as Master of the Order, he suggested that the Jedi make their own instrumental changes. With the Republic fixing itself, it was time the Jedi did the same. Seeing what the corruption within the Republic and the Jedi did to his friend, he was willing to do anything within his power to make sure that no one else suffered the same fate as Dooku. Most of the resolve came from not wanting anyone else to fall down the dark path. It would take years of change, but Mace Windu took complete control over the Jedi Council, which in its own way forced Yoda to step down from his position. It was his choice, and the Council did not vote him out. They simply let him walk and motioned for Windu to become Grand Master, which pushed Plo Koon into the role of Master of the Order. The combined duo of Mace and Plo helped the Order change into what it always should have been. With the Sith forever gone, the Jedi could create the future they wanted. All that decided their fate was whether or not they could avoid a complacent future, or build the foundation of a successful era full of prosperity. And that, my friends, is our story. This is a Patreon grantee requested video, so thank you for requesting this video. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons, Gallivan Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Bane, Cullen Rooney, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Jen Deguin, Sith Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallig, Youngly Slayer 66, Mad Man Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Jacken, Fortis Lexi Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you want to support in other ways, or even request your own videos, go check out the Patreon. Link is down below. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. This was kind of fun. Doing these Dooku videos are always so fun because you get to do like investigative stories, and that's kind of what I was going for here. I wanted the story to be investigative, and I think getting into the whole plot as early as I did would allow for the Jedi to uncover it much faster, getting to the bottom of it and even exposing it. For the actual duels, I don't think Windu could beat Dooku in the first fight. I think what it took for him to beat Dooku was his usage of the dark side. I think that's the only thing that really favors Windu in a fight against Dooku is the dark side, and also the fact that the dark side took a toll on Dooku's body. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you. Thank <laughs> you.